Number 10 is about the p-value approach and how to interpret it and use it when it comes to hypothesis tests. And in this example, we have a p-value of 0.19. And what, uh, what that p-value of 0.19 means is that if we assume our null hypothesis is true, and this is in fact the real accurate population parameter, then 19% of the time, or 19 samples out of every 100, will be at least as extreme as the sample that we just gathered. And I wanted to pull up a normal distribution curve to talk about what at least as extreme means. Um, ignore the actual numbers here. I just wanted to show the normal distribution curve. But if we're saying our p-value is 0.19, it means 19% of samples, which is 19 out of every 100, would be as far away from the mean into the tail or they're at least that far away or even further into the tail, even further farther away from the mean. So p-value 0.19 means that 19 out of every 100 samples is at least as far away from the mean as the sample we got or even further away. And so going back to the hypothesis test, the only reason we ever reject the null is if the sample we get is very rare, very unusual, um, and not likely to happen. And so that would result, that would correspond to a p-value result of being a very, very small percentage, something that we would consider unusual. And um, a standard value for that is 5%, 0.05 or less for a p-value. So if your probability value is higher than 0.05, you do not reject the null hypothesis because it's not an unusual sample to get back. For number 11, we are determining, determining critical values uh, for uh, left, right, left tailed, right tailed, and two tailed test uh, for hypothesis tests. And we're going to be using the t distribution because we're testing a population mean. And if we don't know the population standard deviation, we use the t distribution. If we did know the population standard deviation, we would use the normal distribution. So you can find these critical values either using Excel or StatCrunch. I'm going to show StatCrunch right now because I really like the calculators they have in there um, because they have a nice um, so Stat calculators t distribution. They have a nice visual that goes along with them um, that I think is helpful. So we're determining a right tail test or a left tail test. So just look at the picture. This is shaded in on the left for less than and greater than would be for a right tail test. And then um, we will use in, the between, in between when we're doing two tail tests. But so for a right tail test, if the mean is 0.01, I'm oh, sorry, we're testing the mean. Alpha is 0.01 and uh, with 10 degrees of freedom. So enter your degrees of freedom there. And we want to know um, the probability that we're further out into the right-hand tail bigger than 0.01. I need to have just one decimal there. So compute. So this is our critical value that marks um, the cutoff in the T distribution where only 0.01 or 1% of the distribution is at um, that critical value or even further into the tail. For a left tail test with B, just enter in the different parameters to make sure you have a left tail less than. And then for a two tail test, I'll show that one here. We have alpha at 10%, 0.10. Uh, and it tells us our sample size is 18. And I guess B was based off of sample size as well. So remember your degrees of freedom is one less than the sample size. So a sample size 18 would be 17 degrees of freedom. So your degrees of freedom is one less than your sample size. And uh, let me just hit compute here. It's computing our critical values here and the percentage, the probability that's in between those critical values. So if we wanted alpha to be 10%, 0.10, that means we want 10% in the tails, which means 90% is in between our two critical values. So it's actually split between the two tails. So there's 5% here and 5% there for that total of alpha being 
Um, but then you get those two critical values. They're the exact same number, one negative, one positive, because of symmetry. And that's how you would use the calculator. And number 12, we're doing a hypothesis test. And we have our null and our alternative. And it tells us the sample size. And we want to start off by looking at our sample data, sample mean and sample standard deviation, and computing the test statistic. And basically, we're measuring how far away our sample mean was from our null hypothesis. Here's the formula you need to find the test statistic. You take your sample mean minus the null hypothesis, and we're dividing by the standard deviation from our sample, and that is that number is divided by the square root of our sample size. And I'm finding that in the text here. And so I like to do that in Excel. Take my sample mean minus the null hypothesis uh, that we have. And then we're dividing by our sample standard deviation divided by the square root of our sample size, which was 24. Um, so make sure you use your parentheses correctly so that you do that subtraction on top and then divide by the entire quantity here of our standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. And then since we're doing a not equals hypothesis test, um, to find our critical values here for part B at our level of significance of 1%, 0 0.01, we could come in here to our calculator and stat crunch. Sample size 24 means we have 23 degrees of freedom. And uh, a 0 0.01 for alpha means that we want 99% to be in between our two critical values, and so that there's only 1% out in the two tails. And so these would be our critical values. And part C says to draw a T distribution that depicts the critical region. Basically, it's the opposite of what this picture looks like. The critical region is the part that's in white here, not shaded in. It's these parts in the tails. And only 1% of samples would fall in uh, this region. And that's the critical region. And so here's, here's a picture. And basically the way the hypothesis test works is we're trying to see if the test statistic from our particular sample is really far away from the mean and actually lies in the critical region. And if it does, it's a pretty rare event, a pretty rare sample, and it's going to cause us to reject the null hypothesis. If it doesn't lie in the critical re region, if it's, you know, somewhere shaded in here closer to the center of our distribution, that's when we fail to reject the null hypothesis. Number 13 is another hypothesis test. And we have our null and our alternative and our sample size. And then we have our sample data here, and we're going to start off computing the test statistic. So recall we're going to take our sample mean and subtract it from the null hypothesis, which is what we're assuming to be the population mean. And then we divide by the entire quantity, sample standard deviation divided by square root of the sample size. And that gives us back our test statistic. And so this is a left-hand tail test. Um, our test statistic is negative because our sample means less than the population mean. So we're in the left hand side below the middle of the distribution and we're testing for less than. Um, so from our test statistic even further into the left hand tail, that area represents what the p-value is. And the p-value is the probability of getting a test statistic like we did or even further into the tail. And if we want to approximate the p-value now, we can use our, our chart here. Um, so our um, test statistic is negative 1.55. This is for the right tail. Um, so we would actually, by symmetry, just use positive 1.55. Uh, and our degrees of freedom is 18, because it's one less than the sample size. So if we come down to 18 degrees of freedom, and find where 1.55 would be, it'd be right in between these two values. 
And so looking up, that means our probability of getting a sample like we did is something in between 10% uh, and 5%. And so to conclude this problem, if our significance level is 5%, and we know our p-value is something bigger than that, uh, then we are not going to reject the null hypothesis because we're not less than 5%. Number 14, we're looking at another hypothesis test, and here we're going to use a confidence interval tied in with that. And so what we have is that several years ago, we had the mean age of inmates on death row, and someone is wondering whether that has changed or not. So your null hypothesis is that the mean is still the same, and then our alternative is that it's not the same, that the mean has changed. And so then we go out and we gather our sample, get our sample data, and we're going to construct a 99% confidence interval for the population mean based on that sample data. I'm going to do that in StatCrunch. So in StatCrunch, I'll go to Stat, and then we're using the t-distribution because there's a population mean, and we don't know the population standard deviation. And one sample, and we just have the summary data here. We knew that the sample mean came back at that value listed, and the sample standard deviation came back, and our sample size is listed. So now we want a 99% confidence interval. And we get the lower and upper limits of our confidence interval. And then so how that confidence interval ties back into our heart our hypothesis test, 99% of the time, our confidence interval will contain the actual population mean. And since our null hypothesis is somewhere within this interval, it's between the lower and upper limit, and there's no reason to reject it as a possible value for our population mean. So since our null hypothesis falls within the confidence interval, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. We haven't proven it to be true. We don't know that 36.9 is actually still the correct age, but there's no reason to reject it. It is a legitimate value uh, based off of the hypothesis test we just did. So we're going to fail to reject it. It is within the confidence interval. And number 15, another hypothesis test. This is a good example about um, how a hypothesis test can be used in quality control. So here all our golf balls have to have a certain diameter and we're going to gather a sample uh, to test whether that diameter is being met or not. And we're only gathering a small sample size so we have to verify that certain conditions are met so that we can use our hypothesis test. Uh, we need to see that the diameter is normally distributed and that there's no outliers. So as long as all our uh, points here are within the bounds, the curved lines are either side, we can uh, assume um, that they come from a normal or approximately normal distribution. And in the box plot, there should be no really long whiskers. And the official measurement is 1.5 times the interquartile range, which uh, interquartile range is how wide this blue box is, how wide the box is. And so we don't have good uh, number values for the uh, one side of the box to another. But if you imagine that length and then another half of it added onto it, um, the ends of these whiskers aren't farther out from the box than that. So uh, there are no significant outliers that are more than 1.5 times this box's width uh, away from the rest of the data. So our conditions are met. Uh, to use a hypothesis test, we're going to start We need to come up with the null and the alternative hypothesis. So our null is that uh, the golf balls do meet the requirements, that the mean is 1.68 inches, and our alternative will be that it's not equal to that value. And then so to proceed, we need to start looking at our sample data. I'm going to open it here in StatCrunch. And so to find the test statistic, I need to know the sample mean and the sample standard deviation. And you can find those out right now. You can do that in Excel or you can do that right here. Um, summary stats of your column. We want to find the mean. We want to find the standard deviation. We can hit uh, compute. 
Uh, and then so once you have those, and I'm actually just going to use do the computation using Excel because I think it's easier to use as a calculator compared to StatCrunch. Um, but you do the sample mean, subtract our null hypothesis, and then divide by the entire quantity of our sample standard deviation, which I wrote it out here to six decimal spots. And that's divided by the square root of the sample size. And then that gives you your test statistic. And then uh, we're going to do, do the p-value here. And in StatCrunch, we're doing t-stats here because we have, we're going for a mean and we don't know the population standard deviation. Uh, we actually have the data. Uh, it's in the diameter column. I'm doing a hypothesis test. And just to recall our um, significance level, 0.05. So uh, I guess we don't type that in right here, but we're going to need that for our hypothesis test. And our mean was 1.68. And our alternative uh, was that it's not equal to 1.68. So here we get back. Um, the same values for the sample mean and standard deviation, but then it tells us the p-value as well. So this is the probability of getting a sample like the one we did, or you know, even more extreme, assuming our null hypothesis is true. And so that is considerably bigger than what our alpha was, our significance level. And any value bigger than our significance level means we will not reject the null hypothesis. There's not enough evidence to reject it. Uh, 